There are a few families in this church who every week receive a minimum of three emails from First Congregational Church. First time visitors, be warned. <laughs> These messages are like the sacred canon of church correspondence. I'm talking about the Sunday scoop that our Christian Ed Director, Wendy North, sends out. I'm talking about, of course, the This Sunday at FCC, which Reverend Ann sends out every Friday. And for the youth group parents making it three, they get an update from me. And in these three emails, we're not professing our faith, but we're usually listing the activities that are coming up at FCC. And if you've been getting these three emails, you've seen the words Peace Islands over, over and over again, because Peace Islands has become one of our most beloved partners in ministry. And Peace Islands is an Islamic peace-building organization. And for the youth group, we were invited on June 9th to share an iftar dinner with Peace Islands and to also learn about Ramadan. That night, we arrived in Hasbrook Heights a few minutes late, but we were welcomed very warmly. Standing around, waiting for the night to begin, the night had that same sense of awkwardness that most youth gatherings seem to have that only raise the excitement. But once the night got started, our interactions were very familiar. We laughed. We played getting to know you games, and we even complained together about homework. But the tonality of the songs, the smells of the food, and the sounds of the prayers were new. We took pictures, the kids added one another on Facebook and Snapchat. Wow, I'm sounding old, like, you need to remember those names. Um, and we rode home having learned not just about Islam, but we rode home learning more about hospitality. Peace Islands had invited us to partner with them to live another story and to tell another narrative than the divisive religious divides that we hear so often on the news. But that Sunday, June 12th, 49 people were killed in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. It was understood as another act of religious violence and a hate crime against the LGBTQ community. I was overcome, as Eliz can tell you, or the kids, with this sense of urgency. We had to do something right now. We gathered in Sacred Talk and I asked them if our iftar dinner had been this sign that we had to do something like make a video or have a big project with Peace Islands. But the kids just seemed to say, reach out to Peace Islands and see what they say. So when I got in touch with Sina, their youth director, she simply responded that the relationships are what are so important right now. Two weeks later was the Istanbul airport attack. And this time, I don't know if how you all felt, but this time I just felt completely powerless, completely overcome with fear and a sense that I didn't really want to make any kind of meaning out of it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to post anything on Facebook, even though I saw more and more posts coming. And the anxiety was building because I knew that I had to preach this Sunday. And often preaching means making some kind of meaning, but the act just seemed so senseless. And it seemed offensive to try to put it in some picture that made perfect sense. And with this sense of powerlessness, I decided that maybe just to kill time, I would read the entirety of the Gospel of Luke. And to be honest, again, I was a little bit nervous to do so. I didn't want to hear any more divisive rhetoric. I didn't want to hear about one religion being superior to another. There's enough of that. But when I cracked the book open and I got started, I was reminded that the Gospel of Luke is not a doctrine, it's not a dogma, but it's actually a letter. It's a part of a two-part correspondence between a physician and one of the early followers of the way. That's what they called the early Christians. And the physician is telling this um, other follower stories that have instructions about how to live. How to live in a way that proclaims that the kingdom of God is at hand. 
and I was very surprised to find out that there was actually even more violence in the first century, the time when the Gospel of Luke was written, than there is today. You were much more likely to know someone who had been murdered or to have a feeling that you could be murdered yourself. And this was very surprising to me. However, when you are kind of killing time and you're reading Luke cover to cover, you find that it makes sense and that it's right in there. That even though today's passage, when it's read in isolation, it almost sounds like it's this triumphant march to discipleship and the spread of Christianity. But in reality, when you read about the context, the disciples were thinking of the, about the same sense of powerlessness, the same sense of doubt, the same sense of fear that's over all of us today. In this morning's passage, Luke 10, 1 through 11, Jesus sends out the disciples in, pa in pairs while he, Jesus, is mourning the loss of his partner, John the Baptist, his partner in ministry, John the Baptist. It's amazing, uh, in the early chapters, when John and Jesus' mother are together, the two of them leap in one another's womb. So John and, uh, John and Jesus leap at just the sound of their mothers being in the same womb. And it was John that baptized Jesus in the Jordan, and it was John that proclaimed the way for Jesus' ministry. But at the time of our reading today, Jesus had just found out that John had been beheaded. And there's more uncertainty at the time of our reading. The mission was off to a rough start. Jesus had already sent out 12 before he sent out the 70, and the 12 had been sent back after being rejected in Samaria. The disciples John and James went up to Jesus and, he said, and they said, Can we consume them with fire? We're so angry that they have rejected us. And Jesus said, No. Instead, he sent 70 more to do the same thing that the first 12 were doing, to cross boundaries and to have an inclusive ministry. And in our reading, Jesus gives the disciples some very simple directions. He says, go in pairs, take off your shoes, give a blessing of peace to the people that you meet, eat and drink what is in front of you, and heal the sick. It is like Jesus' five-point plan of discipleship. And he says that if we follow it, that we know that the kingdom of God has drawn near. And I think it is very important to say what Jesus did not tell his disciples to do. He did not tell them to convert anybody in the modern sense of the word. After sending out the 70, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, who is not part of their group, who may not even have their same beliefs, but is lifted up as the model of discipleship. And remember, he's telling this story to people who wanted the, the Samaritans to be consumed with fire. And for a refresher for anybody who hasn't watched any kind of kids' biblical videos recently, the Good Samaritan story is about a man who fell into the hands of robbers, who beat him and left him for dead. And in that story, there's a priest and there's a Levite that walk by the person in need that do, and do nothing. Only the Samaritan acts. He bandaged the man's wounds. He took him to an inn to rest. And Jesus concludes after telling the story by asking, Which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man in need? And they respond, The one who showed mercy. Simple as that. And Jesus says, Go and do likewise. In the face of meaningless violence and feelings of disempowerment, Jesus uplifted the person who cared for the immediate needs of those around him. No matter where that person may have come from, no matter what religion that person may have been, no matter how articulate or educated they were, they answered that call to discipleship. It was the Samaritan who took the time to help the stranger, and in doing so, brought the kingdom of God near. Jesus is saying that our actions, however small, are what change the world. Ideology seems secondary, if important at all, in this story. So that all sounds well and good. 
and folks at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary who were seminarians were actually put to the test. So these were religious leaders that were going to be going into a life of ministry and researchers wanted to know if they were going to answer the uh, call of Jesus and be like the Good Samaritan. So in 1973 there was an experiment that was conducted and they wanted to see if it was the busyness, if it was the feelings of important thoughts, or what it was that kept the Levite and the priest from helping the person in need. So they had these unknowing seminarian students take a questionnaire in one building and then the seminarians were told that they were going to need to travel from one building to another where they were actually going to give a speech on the Good Samaritan. So they fill out the questionnaire and they're about to move and they're told that they're either going to give a, a speech on the Good Samaritan or on jobs that they either have two minutes to get there, ten minutes to get there, or they have twenty minutes to get there. So do you all think that the seminarians took the time and helped out the person that was in need on the side of the road in between the two buildings? Do you all think that they did? Unfortunately, only 40% of the seminarians actually helped out the person who was in need. And this really seemed like they were in need of immediate medical attention. And what the researchers found was that it was the degree of busyness that actually um, determined whether or not the person would stop and help. And unfortunately for me today, who's preaching a sermon on the Good Samaritan, it didn't matter whether or not the seminarians were preaching about the, about the Good Samaritan or giving a talk on jobs, the numbers were exactly the same. And this survey has been used by what are called the New Atheists to say that orthodoxy, right belief, does not necessarily lead to orthopraxy. But when I go back to Jesus' five points to the disciples, and when I go back and really look at the experiment, I think that Jesus was actually speaking about human nature. In the, 70, in the sending of the 70, Jesus' very first instructions, the very first thing that he says to the disciples is, Take off your sandals. And this is a strange direction for people who are about to go on a very, very long journey. If your sandals are off, you're probably not going very fast. But Jesus was emphasizing the point to slow down. Under stressful conditions like we felt these past few weeks, many of us react like, like I did. We want to rush to action. We want to change the world right now and do something that's big. We want to do something that's important. Remember, the disciples' situation on the surface also seemed very rushed in the first century. Jesus had revealed that his death was imminent. The mission was off to a rough start, and the government was killing folks, including Jesus' partner, John the Baptist. But Jesus reiterated this point, do not rush. Not only did he say, take off your sandals, but he went on. If there's anyone who shares your peace, remain in that house. Stay and eat and drink with those people. Jesus was setting up the conditions so the disciples would have a long life of service. So they could be present with those around them. That the kingdom was coming. One blessing. And one meal at a time. Previous studies before the Good Samaritan research also showed that there was one other factor that led to people actually helping someone in need. And that was whether or not they were alone. If there was somebody that was walking alongside and they saw someone in need, people were much more likely to stop. Again, Jesus was very intuitive and he was a master of human behavior. Before sending out the disciples, Jesus had the 70 pair up. They would not travel alone. Partners are not just company. Partners keep us safe. And they keep us accountable. When we feel overwhelmed, partners can help us see the picture from a new lens. And if our partner doesn't share our worldview, that only expands our vision. The Gospel tells us to work in pairs, to form partnerships. Because as Sina from Peace Islands told me, we build the world that we want to see through relationship. And when we slow down, 
to build the peaceful communities for the healing of one another, Jesus says that the kingdom of God has drawn near. Looking back at the month of June at FCC, we were on another level of reaching across boundaries in a spirit of peace and a spirit of healing. FCC paired with MESH to serve the homeless. We paired with a number of different organizations in Montclair to have the vigil for Orlando. Most recently, Naima Tryman led us in pairing with the NAACP to have intergenerational talks on race and class and the issues involved in our community. And I think that if we look around in this church, it doesn't just have to be big church programs. I'm sure that there are people in this church that are living out Jesus' five-point plan of discipleship, and we don't even know about it. So remember, Jesus simply said, find your allies. Take off your shoes, a.k.a. slow down. Give a blessing of peace to those that you encounter. Eat and drink what is put in front of you. And finally, serve others. If we can do that, then even in this chaotic world, we can say that the kingdom of God has drawn near.